now we have two daughters, and both of them have sort of grown up with the inside the, the framework of the, it's possible to be an artist or it's possible to do something you like mm -hmm. um, and actually make some money at it. Hi everyone, welcome back to Vermont Craft Tours. I'm Sarah Scully, and today I'm joined by Chris Lan of Chris Lan Designs out of Brattleboro, Vermont. Chris, thanks for being with me today. Thanks for having me. It's nice to be here. Yeah. Um, so Chris and I met at the uh, handcraft uh, Vermont Handcrafters show up in Burlington a few weeks ago. Um, I was admiring his jewelry. He was parked next to um, the friend of mine that I was helping out at the show. Um, and I just wanted this chance to talk a little more uh, about what you do, Chris. So um, how did you get started in jewelry making and metalsmithing? Um, well, when I was back in college, I took a basic class, just an elective, um, something to you know fill out my course load and uh, took a basic jewelry and metals class. Um, mm -hmm. That taught me some of the basics of you know how to cut, how to solder, how to join, you know, different things like that. Um, but it didn't really go very far um, after that um, for, for another probably 10 or 15 years. It was mm. just a hobby, um, mm. something that I did. I occasionally made stuff for myself. Um, and I was a newspaper editor at that time after school. Um, so I was working at newspapers at night, putting the paper to bed, and then coming home in the middle of the night. And at that point, um, in 2002, um, our daughter was born. And that wasn't going to work schedule-wise. We decided that one of us was going to stay home. Mm -hmm. So my wife had a, had a job that, that fit our schedule and made sense and everything. So I decided to stay home. And then while I was home, then I started looking around. I'm like, okay, well, what else can I do from home? I did some graphic design. I did some, you know, editing freelance um, stuff from home. But I really wanted to do something that was a little more creative or a little bit more, you know, a little bit more expressive. Mm -hmm. And so I started taking the hobby that I had been doing and, and sort of massaging that into, you know, working on my skills on my own in my studio that I set up in my basement and uh, turned that into, you know, honed my skills to the point where I could start doing shows and things like that. And then it just sort of grew organically from there. And that's been what, 14 years now. So. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's great. I think a lot of people who have handcrafted businesses often start with it as a hobby and then decide that they like doing it so much that they want to get paid for their work and uh, do it full time. So it's good that you were able to make that work with your, you know, with your family um, obligations and, and the kind of lifestyle you wanted to have. Um, yeah, and it's been great because that's then turned into, you know, now, now my dog, now I have two daughters and both of them have sort of grown up with the inside the, the framework of uh, it's possible to be an artist or it's possible to do something you like. Mm -hmm. um, and actually make some money at it and not have to fit into, you know, the, um, a career role, you know, another career track thing. You can be flexible and you can, you sort of create your own path. Right. So. Especially with, um, I think, well, entrepreneurship, I think has really taken off as a kind of a lifestyle choice in the last 10 years or so. I've just seen a lot more people talking about it and doing it. Um, but also, you know, alternatives to having even a college education, um, necessarily, um, uh, with college debt on the rise and all of that, it, it, yeah, it, you know, it's nice, it's nice to have a parent. I have, my dad was a, a plumber professionally and he always wanted me to learn a trade. He thought that was a good thing instead of the opposite way around, which is, oh, you have to have a college degree to fall back on. Now it seems to be kind of going the other direction. Um, I, uh, so you said your switch to pro was really to, to going professional was really you know driven by this desire to have a creative outlet that you could also make money at. Um, why? So did you consider any other kind of creative career, or was it just that you knew jewelry making at that point, and that was something you wanted to continue with? Um, yeah, jewelry had been something that I had kind of fantasized about doing um, for money, sort of in conjunction with with a job or something, you know, like mm -hmm. working full time. And then I had these visions of doing jewelry part time, but there's, you know, to make any, to get any kind of return and make it worthwhile, it really has to be a full time because like any other business, you know, the making of the stuff is a whole big part of it, but then you have to add on all the business and the bookkeeping and everything like that. Right. And so, and marketing is huge. And, yeah. yeah. <laughs> all it becomes there's no way to do it without it being a full-time job mm -hmm. and 
in reality, it still ends up being like a part-time job that you get paid, or it's a full-time job that you get paid part-time for, sort of, <laughs> in a lot right. of cases, you know, so yeah. a lot of it's administrative stuff that's an unnecessary evil, so, um, yeah, I found there wasn't a way to do it sort of halfway, um, mm-hmm. and, and have it sustain itself, but doing it full speed, you know, and which really, like I said, is kind of, if I look at the time I spend in the studio, yeah, I really spend probably, it's probably, you know, 20 hours a week actually in the studio is, is probably a good week, um, you know, Mm -hmm. juggling family and things like that. But then the rest of the time, you know, then I put in however many other hours for the administrative stuff and family life. And, and in, in the end, this is, it's a great second income for our family, but it's not, it's not, um, we're not supporting ourselves solely this way. And I really respect people who manage to do that, um, Mm -hmm. with their art. Yeah, the people that I know are able to do that do work about 60 hours a week probably doing that. So it's a huge commitment. Um, I want to talk a little bit about your aesthetic and your uh, style, I guess. Um, I was looking through your catalog again, refreshing my memory from the show, um, because I remembered some pieces that look very organic and natural, you know, twig and leaf shapes and that kind of thing. But you actually have quite a range. I saw things that reminded me of Viking Roman, Edwardian, um, even some stuff that looked more mid-century modern that was like, you know, circles within squares. And um, so what, uh, do you feel like you have a unified style or are you just really interested in a lot of different things and experimenting? I, my stuff sort of falls into sort of two different categories. It's like, mm-hmm. um, I, I am drawn to nature forms and the solid forms. I do a lot of um, castings, sand castings, where mm-hmm. I use things like sticks and stones and leaves and um, and clay models that I make myself to do solid castings in sand. Um, so that's sort of one camp. And then the other sort of direction I'm pulled is the, the really clean and precise and tight, you know, sort of um, textile techniques. Um, I do a lot of knitting of chains with fine silver and weaving. And uh, so, yeah, I've kind of got the sort of unifying thing behind all my stuff is my technique. My technique Mm. is, all my techniques are primitive. Mm -hmm. Um, There's not really anything in my studio that's more uh, technologically advanced than really a hammer and a flame and, mm. you know, steel draw plates and a hand crank rolling mill that I use to, you know, make my own sheet and wire and everything. So everything for me flows out of technique. So I, I will do a technique, like I'll, I'll come up with a, a section of woven, which I actually happen to have a piece sitting here on the desk next to me. This is in process, but, um, a piece of woven, you know, fine silver wire and I'll, I'll make a length of that and then I'll look at it and I'll say, well, what can I make out of that? And Mm -hmm. then I'll, I'll be inspired by the shape itself and turn it into something. But it's interesting that you see a lot of different influences in my stuff because I'm intentionally, I throughout all my work, I've been intentionally kept myself naive. I don't really study. I don't search online to Mm -hmm. compare my jewelry to what other people, people are doing. I don't have a lot of, I don't know a lot of names in the, in the industry or, you know, in the field. Um, I have friends who are great jewelers and things like that, but I don't, I I try to keep myself separate, um, intentionally so that everything that I design is really just as much for myself as it really can be. But like everybody else, it's like design influences come at us from all directions, just in everyday life. So everything, everything in the world is designed. So you know, I take cues from architecture, um, mm-hmm. ancient, you know, you know, old historical or, you know, prehistoric art and things like that, that, that I've seen over the years, it all sort of soaks in and gets stirred up and comes out. So great. That's, That's fascinating. I, I really appreciate your, uh, ability to stay open like that and not lock yourself into a niche. I think it could be, um, I could see, I mean, with my knitting patterns, for example, I will sometimes make something and I'll go, oh, that was fun. I'll make 10. <laughs> you know? uh, and I could see how it might be tempting to do that, but um, just keeping it keeping it fresh for yourself and also uh, really making sure that each piece that you make is truly unique um, for the person who buys it or commissions it. 
Um, yeah, and that's not to say that I don't do, I don't repeat designs. You know, there are some designs that sort of rise to the surface as being, you know, really successful. They they touch a touch a chord with people, and mm -hmm. so I'll do things. And while each one's individually made, um, they might be all of a kind. Um, some of them might be nearly identical, where to the point where only I can tell the difference from one to the next. Mm -hmm. But and, and then others will be, you know, each one will be a slightly different design. Um, so I kind of and started out doing things one piece at a time and and individually made um, mm -hmm. everything was one of a kind but I've since sort of relaxed that a little bit and gotten into a, just a flow of well, what do I want to make today well, I've made this before I kind of I will make some more of that mm -hmm. um, another big drive for me is because it's all about technique it's like I am really serious about everything that I make like each piece of my jewelry is 100% made um, handmade so it's all it's all smithed. You know, mm -hmm. most of it is started out as scrap silver or gold or, or casting grain, which is little beads of silver that then everything gets melted down and turned into something else. Mm -hmm. uh, for years, even in my knitting and my weaving, I would melt down, you know, I'd, draw, I'd pour an ingot of silver and mm -hmm. then I would use my hand crank mill to roll that down and then draw it into wire. So I would make, you know, the fine wire that I use for weaving all from wow. scratch. Um, yeah gotten away from that a little bit um, these days it's very labor intensive and hard to get paid for that kind of effort but I still do make my wire in a lot of cases just because I need wire and, and I don't want to wait a week for you know a shipment or something like that from a supplier in, in the southwest or wherever it might come from um, but all my clasps and chains and everything are all all handmade and that's a serious wow. drive for me is that's why I started knitting chains in the first place was I didn't want to buy chains um, and then hang, mm -hmm. you know, I want to make a pendant that was a focal point and then buy a chain that was made by a machine and, and hang it on it and, and call it done. Right. Um, so <laughs> I can really appreciate that. Um, I imagine since you're so into um, technique that that also really helps you understand metallurgy very closely. It's working so intensely with the materials at, at every stage even if you don't do it that way every single time having that base of knowledge you know it's like spinning I, I keep drawing these analogies but you talk about knitting and weaving and it's the same thing in fiber arts because you can go back to um okay well washing the washing the fleece off the sheep and spinning it yourself before you knit it and so there's a lot of parallels there that and I can appreciate that to to really know what you're working with and be being a master of control over how it, how the final product's going to look. Yeah, it's, yeah. it's extremely satisfying to know, mm -hmm. to have the confidence to know that I can just sit down and whatever I want to make, I have, if I have a lump of silver um, that's scrapped, I know that I have the means to do whatever I want to do. I can work it through from the beginning to the end. Mm -hmm. um, and that's that's obviously developed over over the years to, um, it's probably only been in the past, you know, six or seven years that I've, totally leaned into that and, and felt confident um, to that level. Mm -hmm. And now that's sort of um, fueling a, a new direction for me, which is starting to teach some of that. So I'm starting to teach um, sand casting mm -hmm. workshops and, um, and um, also, you know, basic skills like the specific things like soldering and things like that. So we're, I'm working with a friend here in town named Robert Border, who's been a jeweler for 40 years and has a mm -hmm. studio at um, so we work out of his studio and we have myself and a couple other people who are, you know, sort of guest instructors who come and go through his studio and we're trying to set that up as a thing. But it's nice to think that now being self-taught that now I have something actually that I can offer mm -hmm. um, back. So. That's great. Yeah, I wanted, I saw the workshops on your site, so I wanted to ask you more about that. Um, looks like you have uh, several programs planned for 2018. Do you want to tell our um, audience a little more about those classes? Sure, sure. Um, yeah, like I said, the ones that I'll be directly involved with will be sand casting. Um, that's one that I've done before. We started our, our series sort of last fall in an organized way, and now we're now we're more organized for the spring. <laughs> um, sand casting is it's it's a primitive technique. It just uses sand um, that has some clay and things in it um, to bind it and you know hold a shape, sort of like a sandcastle, if you think of that. Mm -hmm. um, you can use that to make impressions with things like twigs or stones or, you know, models that you make yourself or whatever. Um, and then that leaves a void in the sand and then that sand, that void is 
can pour silver into it and create a solid cast form mm -hmm. um, with some nice effects. So it's like, um, so yeah, it, it's accessible. It's not really required to have any previous knowledge or anything. Um, so that's one of the, the things that uh, I'll be teaching. And then the other, like I said, that I'm directly involved in is a soldering workshop, which is just, you know, a lot of people have basic metal skills. They know how to cut and they know how to, you know, bend and form and wrap and things like that. But then a lot of people hit a wall where once you start dealing with fire and a torch, mm -hmm. um, they kind of get intimidated and don't go any further. And, and, and a lot of even people with some experience find that soldering is a thing that they could use some more insight into because it, it's nuanced and has, there's a lot of in, intuition sort of involved in it. So yeah. we're going to share our experience and sort of try to nudge people along that. Um, in addition to that, then through the studio, my friend Bob is also offering, um, I don't know how many total, probably seven um, workshops that start out with a basic metal smithing, you know, basic silversmithing class that where you, each of them is project oriented, mm -hmm. where you make these and that you get to take home. Um, so one of them is a cigar band, you know, basic, you know, ring band, basically mm -hmm. forming a ring and soldering it. Um, now there is a stacking ring workshop where you make a, a, a series of rings that all sort of you know lay together, mm -hmm. and, are, and that involves some stamping um, with uh, hammers and stamps and things like that. Oh, and yeah. I don't know what I might be forgetting, but that's most of it. We're repeating those you know uh, in a few different schedules, so we can try to accommodate people who want to fit in. Mm -hmm. But it's all on the website. I don't know if that's an appropriate place to mention. My website is chrislanddesigns.com. Yep. And, and from there, you can see the workshops that I'm involved in. And then from that page, you can see, you can go to um, bordersjewelry.com to see the entire list that we're offering through the studio. Great. Yeah. And we'll link to that in the show notes as well as um, you have your Etsy shop up there too, if people are curious about your yep. uh, pieces that you have for sale or commissions. You do uh, commission work as well, yes? I work do. with clients to design things? Yeah. My wedding yep. bands were, um, our wedding bands are, uh, were created that way um with the jeweler um down in dc actually uh <laughs> where we were living at the time but yeah I, I i i enjoy that process of design not knowing much about jewelry design or terminology but no having an image in mind for what we wanted um mm -hmm. that was it was fun and actually the guy we worked with was a was an architect was his background. So I can see how like the architecture, graphic design can really help play a role um, sure. in jewelry design. That seems to be a common theme that I've seen before. Um, yeah, it's very interesting. Um, it's fun. It, it is fun just to, on the idea of, of working with somebody to design something. I don't, I did, I, I've done sort of a whole, whole range of things um, from, you know, pure custom designs that were, you know, from the ground up where it was really somebody's idea that they wanted to have in fact, that's how I got into sand casting um, in mm -hmm. the first place. And had to design it; it had to be cast, and and it was accessible. Um, but most of the the commission pieces that I do are they're sort of variations on a theme. It's like I've learned over the years that I can't be everything to everyone. I can't mm -hmm. do everything, but what I can do is I can offer my voice. I can offer the things that I do with input, you know, from you know, you know, so I can customize things and personalize things, and and I really do enjoy knowing the person that I'm making a piece of jewelry for as mm -hmm. I'm making it. I, I really think that, that, you know, the metal and the process and everything has sort of a memory. So I, I think that, you know, my state of mind and what I'm thinking about, it helps if I know where it's going. Um, it, it means something it has. And so uh, like wedding band designs are really satisfying because it's a, a meaningful mm -hmm. project that, you know, it has some, something that has like, um, sort of a life of its own will continue after after it's made and that, that I can actually contribute something and offer something um, sort of to the universe and to the people who are going to be wearing them. Right. Um, so. And that's the nice thing about jewelry too is it's, it's it has such a longevity behind it. Uh, it's not going to wear out. Um, Hopefully so. not. <laughs> so not just for the person but also for them to, you know, maybe pass down or, or something like yeah. that. Your legacy will live for a long time. Yeah, That's I love the cool. fact I was just talking to my friend Bob again, the jeweler. We have lots of esoteric conversations about jewelry, but we were talking about, you know, sort of the the uh, archaeological aspect, the, the, mm. the uh, uh, what's the word, artifact mm -hmm. value of, of something like jewelry that a lot of other 
you know, our, you know, certainly pottery has that, but a lot of other things, right. you know, literally 2000 years from now, somebody could dig up a, a piece of mine somewhere and, and see, you know, what it looked like and largely what it looked like when it, when it was lost or whatever happened to it. So right. it's neat to, that things, things can survive. Yeah. That's very cool. Um, my husband Rick and I have been watching Time Team. It's a British um, archaeology show that was largely run in the 90s. I think it ran for about 15 years. It's all available on YouTube. Um, and it's fascinating because they will go into an old grave site and start digging. And oftentimes even the bones are, you know, eaten away. But they'll find sort of a shadow of a grave and then a brooch. And that's it. And that's all you know about that person is... <laughs> based on that brooch, oh. you know, did it have stone set in it? Was it pretty simple? You know, and that, that's the information that you have. So yeah, jewelry is, is very, uh, it can tell you a lot, I think, about yeah. the person fact, wearing it. It's just because, of, you know, because of that whole aspect too, it's like, and you know, where I'm at in my life and everything, um, it's like a right now project that I've been thinking a lot about lately is making reliquaries, you know, a lot of a series mm. of, uh, of reliquaries or things like that, which that's the whole purpose. It's like, you know, something that can just live on wherever mm -hmm. it could be. You know, I picture making a set for myself, you know, making that my, those, my plans for, you know, the end of my days. But I, it, it, it would be a beautiful idea to think of mm -hmm. somebody who follows me just throwing a reliquary in a lake or something and, and having that be, that's the end of it. You know, that's where it stays as opposed to, a headstone or something like that, that, you know, gets forgotten and, and, you know, disrepair and, and mm -hmm. people feel like they need to go visit it and things like that. So. Right. Even, yeah. Yeah. That's a nice thought. I like that. Um, we'll tell me a little bit more about what has been uh, inspiring you lately and what other plans you have for 2018. That's a good question. Um, I've been doing, you know, the craft show circuit and, and a really limited um, sort of approach to the craft show circuit. I usually do anywhere from six to eight shows a year um, since I've started, and that sort of ebbed and flowed. Um, I guess that's a good question. I don't know that I have different plans for this year. Um, um, yeah, I'll probably be I'll be doing a, a raft of shows again, probably in the same same range. One thing I'm excited about is that's been growing, but it's not really new this year, but I'm a member of a, a group where I live here in Brattleboro called Brattleboro West Arts. And we're mm. about membership ebbs and flows, but we're about, you know, three dozen people who mm -hmm. all live within a few square miles. And so originally when the group was formed, like in 2009, I think it was all about sort of the idea of geography and we're all bound together and we all have our studios here in this, this, this region. Mm -hmm. Um, the group's now growing beyond that geography and we're also including people from Brattleboro itself and things like that. But, um, but we we're starting to get together and organize ourselves and do our own shows and mm. things like that. We've had studio tours and that we've been, we've organized in the past and things like that. And we do an annual show at least once a year, um, uh, we're, a number of us get together and, and show in a sort of a gallery setting. Mm -hmm. So it's what's that's what's exciting for me is, is sort of getting deeper into this this group of people who are friends and neighbors and really world class artists um, in in their own right. So just going deeper and getting better at what I'm doing and taking influence from other people in different different media and different mm -hmm. techniques and things like that. I was going to say this group isn't all jewelers. Then they're different. Uh, oh, no. forms. I'm the, yeah, I'm one of, well, there are two jewelers. I'm the only one who's exclusively a jeweler. Um, there's another jeweler who does really wonderful encaustic paintings, and there's another mm -hmm. um, woman who's a, a glass bead artist mm -hmm. who is, you know, moving into jewelry mm -hmm. as well. So it's like everybody's sort of, we're, we're sort of cross-pollinating each other mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. learning different, different techniques. In fact, we get together sometimes, the, the three of us that I just mentioned, and yeah. just sort of play in a studio, one of, you know, one of our studios and work on techniques or whatever we're working on at that time, but share insight. Oh, that's, that's fun. I, I've had this same conversation with a couple of people I've interviewed so far. And it's that when you work alone, 
Um, it can get kind of lonely, even for us introverts. Eventually, <laughs> we would like to yeah. talk to somebody. Yeah. So going going yeah. to craft shows is nice because you can chat with your customers and get that positive feedback and, oh, I love your work. Um, but, uh, you know, having an artist group uh, to to get that kind of positive reinforcement and, and new inspiration from has got to be really nice, too. Yeah, it really is. Yeah. yeah, and it's like I didn't know how much I wanted uh, socialization mm -hmm. until I, I was lucky enough to when we bought our house in 2010 we moved into the middle of this like you know geographical area mm -hmm. with this where this group was you know sort of getting up and running mm -hmm. and I didn't realize how much I wanted that or how much it, how enriching and, and fulfilling that that was I thought well I make my stuff I take it to the shows mm -hmm. I kind of become a, 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 an extrovert for a weekend when I do a show you know I talk to people at the at the craft shows and and yeah, and get all that, like you said, all that feedback. It's it's really gratifying to talk to people, and I like to talk about technique, and it teaches me what I. It, it helps to solidify what I do. In fact, mm. to talk about it, um, to people who either don't know anything about jewelry or, or do know something about jewelry, and then uh, you know we can talk about technique at the show and things like mm -hmm. that. So yeah, it's, great. it's nice to be social. <laughs> yeah, it's a good. Thing. Yeah. Um, uh, kind of going back to uh, something we were talking about before with, with inspiration, but also with learning techniques. So you said you're largely self-taught. How did that come about or evolve over time for you? Did you watch YouTube videos? Did you take more classes? Um, did you just play around until you figured it out? Or yeah, how did that the, work? The basic class that I took gave me a sort of a foundation where I could be making stuff. And then from there, mm -hmm. <clears throat> excuse me, from that point, you know, where I could saw some sheet metal and I could um, you know, cold rivet something together and, or get a torch and do some soldering and things like that. It's like, I could add a technique every year. I tried to add a technique to what I was doing. So it's like, at first when I started, I was just doing, um, fabricated, um, designs with materials that I bought, um, sheet and wire and things like that. Um, then I moved, then I added, I wanted to get some texture. So I thought, okay, well, I did some acid etching where I could do designs on the surfaces of the sheet metal and things like that. Um, then I added gemstone setting. I thought, mm -hmm. okay, well, I got some sparkle. So I started, you know, experimenting with gemstones. And there's basically, you know, there's, there's a very short list of, you know, one or two books that you could have in your, in your library that could give you as a reference, mm -hmm. um, you know, a way to approach uh, all the different techniques. Cause like I said, everything's primitive. Um, at some mm -hmm. point people sitting around a fire figured out how to do all this stuff in, in prehistory really. Right. Uh, so it's nice to know that it, you know, I can do that. I can recreate that sort mm -hmm. of process. Yeah. And um, that knowledge is still available. Um, which sure. I know a lot of ancient processes, we're not quite sure how they got that particular glaze on that pot or, or whatever right. it was. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and then so. as I grew, then, then, like I said, I got to a point where I wanted to, I decided, I, I knew that I wanted everything to be handmade a hundred percent by myself. Mm -hmm. So, and then I started thinking, okay, how do I make a chain? And then I, then I went to, you know, other books and the internet and I'm like, well, what techniques are out there? And then, so I found a technique that I, I settled on at first called Viking knit for mm -hmm. making the chains that I started making. And then that sort of took off in its own right. And so that led me to, okay, now I want to do some weaving. So I, you know, learned how to do card weaving again from a book. Mm -hmm. And then I liked that idea. And, and one of the other members of Brattleboro West Arts that I mentioned is a, is a um, sort of world-class weaver named Jackie Abrams. And mm -hmm. she does textile weavings and baskets and things. And she travels and she's taught in British Columbia and Australia. And, mm -hmm. and she's gone to Africa to teach people to weave there. And, wow. Um, so I took a workshop with her and that again advanced that's like the only sort of um, professional development that I've really <laughs> done is one mm -hmm. workshop with somebody who's a close friend and mm -hmm. uh, and that's really paid off you know in terms of just opening up my mind to you know new techniques so it's all been a, a sort of a really sort of organic process See, I just try to keep adding a technique every once in a while to you know increase the depth of what I'm doing mm -hmm. and keep it interesting and fresh for you too. Yep. Yeah. And the same thing happens sort of naturally without any effort by working in my friend Bob's studio. And it's mm -hmm. like, it's like, it's all just influence. It's like he does, you know, 
stamping and things that I haven't done, but I get to watch him do it. And I'm like, yeah, there's sometimes when I think, yeah, uh, there's a design I may do that I could see, okay, that would be a technique that, mm -hmm. that I could use. And now because I have access to the tools, I can play with it. You know, that you can do it. And that's kind of what we want to do with the workshops is we want to make a, a place where somebody can experiment and play with a little bit of, little bit of guidance, um, mm -hmm. somebody sort of at the next bench over, not necessarily looking over their shoulder, but have the tools around so they don't have to invest in all the tools that it takes to set up a, a jewelry studio, mm -hmm. but they get to sort of play and, and develop skills and see what direction they might, might want to go with a little bit of input from somebody who's been there. Right. Yeah, that's very valuable. I'm wondering, I'm, I'm of course thinking about the craft tours I'm putting on and wondering if maybe we could have a jewelry one, if there's enough interest, that would be a fun thing to work towards um, as a future offering. That would be great. Yeah, I'll have to, I'll have to check out what, what your tours are. I, again, I have to yeah. apologize. I know what I know of you from talking at the show, but I haven't had a chance um, in the holiday season. It's what time of year we're in right now. <laughs> exactly. Um, That's yeah, crazy. No, we, we booked this interview last minute too, so thanks for making time available. Yeah, right now yeah. I've got I've got uh, fiber, um, uh, food, and beer are the three crafts that we're going to focus on for 2018, but I'm hoping to add more. I think people are interested in pottery. I think that's something that we could do kind of in a day workshop. I think uh, a basic jewelry making class would be fun for people. I have a friend who does glass blowing, and mm -hmm. she does demonstrations and kind of guided um, guided helping you make uh, a glass um, at her studio. So I'm hoping to get in on that. So I think there's a lot of different directions and maybe even a kind of a mixed tour where we do a different thing every day um, for people who don't have one specific focus, but are just interested in making stuff with their hands and learning stuff. So yeah, sounds yeah. beautiful. Could be fun. Cool. Great. Well, thank you again, Chris, for taking time today to chat with us and um, Pleasure. It was, it was great to get to know you better. And thank you, audience, for joining us. Um, we'll have all of the links to uh, Chris's website and everywhere you can find his work online. And we'll be back next week with another interview. So join us then. Cheers. <laughs>